How's it going, everybody? Welcome back into debate night. Brody Smith is our host tonight. <laughs> um, I'm back in the seat. Uh, had a week off. I heard that last week got contentious. It got crazy. Um, I'm interested to get the man of the people update because I just heard there were screaming matches going on, and I was a little bummed that I missed it. Honestly, I um, excited to be back. Hopefully, don't miss any more action this year. Uh, but we got four great analysts today. We got a lot to talk about. Uh, including some really recent events. Um, Brody, break it down for me. Yeah, yes, last week's episode was electric. Um, you know, here it is. When stuff is said that needs to be addressed, it's going to get addressed. Uh, do I see this week being that electric? No. Now, if we were a drama podcast or a clickbaity podcast, then sure, I would probably make something up to get riled up about that I really don't care. But that's not that's not what we are. So I doubt that we're going to have the electricity. I don't know. Gary might say something crazy. We'll find out. But I doubt we'll probably have the electricity that we had last week. Uh, with that being said, though, two things. First off, man, the people appreciate you all uh, commenting last week's episode. A lot of comments. A lot of comments. But the top one was, in my opinion, and in your guys' opinion, because you voted it up as the top comment, is from Tropical Tropically... This is mm. not helping my case of not being able to pronounce <laughs> words. Tropically? I don't even know if that is a word. I think it's just tropically. Yeah, it would just be tropically. tropically. Am I saying that right? Yep. Tropically. Am I adding a syllable? Tro <laughs> tropically brewing. Well, it's like you don't say actually. You say actually. Tropically. I don't know how to say that word. But anyways, TB said in disc golf, the word drama means anything I disagree with. I'm not comfortable enough with myself to accept it. Mm. And that was the top mm. comment. So uh, second thing I was going to say, something that um, I think will help. And Silas, if you want to jump in, I don't even know. Does Silas have a mic? I don't even know if he has a mic. He always has a mic. If Silas wants to jump in, I think my microphone kind of sucks. So listeners out there, tour life debate night wherever you're listening i'm going to upgrade my microphone and i think that's going to help a lot of those people out there that don't like it when i yell because i think the microphone sucks and i think it makes it worse i think Brody it's needs, still gonna be bad but he needs three cloud lifters to get his compression on his yelling um gary's also, here lighting is all jacked up gary, i don't know why i look like a potato today yeah gary's here still no bricks um did you get a fresh cut gary i did it's just too warm to have all that hair and you know what you got to get a cut off sometimes but uh really excited to be back this past weekend i was out catting for my my boy andy hansen at uh, the birdie open at iron hill Ooh. big eights here going on out there and i was just Kyle justin the, rosak eighth place yeah i was just sitting on the course wondering uh why are we not having the uh the champions cup here in 2025 it's a good course. course. It's a it's a really good course. Uh, Hunter's back. Hunter's internet looking good right now. Not a me. Good for now. I do want to just point out um, my mental state might deteriorate as the episode goes on. <laughs> did have some did have some mold removed from the basement about twenty feet from me. Can definitely smell the chemicals they used. I, I don't know. Things could get interesting down there. It's uh, it's strong. It's strong. I feel like I'm I feel like I'm at an indoor pool right now. So things could get interesting. I'm gonna fall over in his chair. Okay, well let's keep an eye on that. Um, and then Dustin is here as well. Yeah. Hey, everybody. I'm excited to be here. Got a tall ladder to climb tonight against this group. But uh, Hunter, if it makes you feel any better, I'm in my teenage son's room, so there's some smells in here, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> At least mine smells clean. I think I'd rather be smelling chlorine right now. <laughs> I fair can enough. say that because he doesn't watch the show. So <laughs> fair. Uh, fair enough. All right. Let's get into the show here. First topic, we're going to talk a little about the European Pro Tour, obviously um, still happening over there. Are you watching? Are you not? Um, so the European Pro Tour events may not boast the strongest fields, but it's tough to argue against their professionalism, large galleries, and beautiful courses. Do you think it is an issue that the American and European events showcase a different brand and quality of event at times? Should the Pro Tour be working harder to ensure their product is universal from week to week, whether you're um, here in, in the States or abroad? Brody, what are your thoughts? Yeah, this is an interesting question. Um because, yeah, I don't think it's smart for a company, you know, let's just broad it out, for a company to – there's reasons why companies have logos, have marketings, have colors. There's a reason why they want 
stuff to go back and look like, hey, I know exactly that's this company or this company, right? But with that being said, you know, disc golf is still in this world right now of where I think a lot of us don't even really understand really what the European Pro Tour still is. Like, is that owned by the disc golf pro tour? I think still some people don't even know that they basically bought it out or took it over. They still view it as a separate tour, even though now the points do directly impact, which I don't know if we're going to talk about that. Cause that's a whole nother topic about should that actually be happening? Um, but I think my biggest takeaway from this is the pro tour should be looking at what is happening over there that the fans are enjoying, that the fans are liking, and then try to implement it into things that are happening in the States and vice versa. Um, Now, obviously the commentary changes all the time, so you can't really grab the commentators from over there, but if they like the way the set looks or if they like the style of courses that they play over there, maybe look to try to implement that over here. But at the end of the day, I think as long as the marketing and all that is the same, I think that is all that really matters. Yeah, brand consistency is definitely a a huge part of the equation. Gary, you're our big European disc golf advocate here. So what are your thoughts? Yeah, I don't I don't think the difference is too big of an issue because I think it's an inevitability because the the fields are just different. Um, The people running the events are kind of different and the fan base is just very different. Um, I don't think you're ever going to have the same product in practice, but you may be able to have the same product in spirit. Um, the American side of the tour could definitely take some lessons from the European side. You know, the courses are beautiful, but I'm not like really just talking geographically. If you look at, like the OB markings and the white stakes, it made it very easy to understand visually kind of what the OB looked like. And the courses are in pristine condition. Uh, I think with every single event, the live coverage and the post-produced coverage gets better and better. Big shout out to MDG Media because they crushed it again for a second event. Um, I also think the European side understands how to treat pros. It's in the rules for the spectators that they are not allowed to approach the pros while walking throughout the course, going from place to place, or even in the parking lot. Um, so they have designated areas for signings. And you could see on the coverage, they did a very good job making sure that the, the crowd was not getting near the pros during the event, moving around the holes. Um, but here's a big one. The European market also understands how to monetize their fans. I think this drives the attendance. The general admission at Copenhagen was free. It was It's $33 for general attendance for the whole weekend for other events. And the diehards, for, for $220, you get some really cool stuff, tournament discs, signed by the winner you get on-site private parking you get uh, a tournament bag you get a private signing session uh, you get access to the whole course a really cool one is you get to play the course um, you get free access to gk pro skins all that kind of stuff what do we need though i think the european tour needs to be grouped together spread around the major more american and pros will attend and make for a more seamless product yeah you definitely you definitely feel the sense of pride in the product being put on over there in europe the groups that get behind these events you know seppo was a big uh, uh, mm-hmm. obviously a big part of the Turkey open. You really feel like they treat it like a major every single week. Um, Hunter, what are your, what are your thoughts on the European pro tour and the differences? Well, I'm not really going to hit on the last point Gary brought up. Cause I think he, he nailed it on the head that like one of the issues I think we see and why they feel so different is the scheduling. Like, I think this should be put together, but let's just assume that for whatever reason, they want to keep this separate where we're flashing over. They were flashing back. What this creates is there's always going to be this issue because it almost gives us what the silver events used to give us. So I don't necessarily think it's an issue, but I think that these differences should be intentional. What do I mean by that? Well, like I said, this gives us what the silver events used to give us. Last week, we had Dustin telling us that there's no way to rise through the ranks as a commentator. This is a great opportunity. We now have a event that is going on that is going to have less of your typical viewers. It's going to have a higher amount of European viewers, absolutely, but a lower amount of people who are watching all the majors, people who are watching the main Pro Tour events going on. So this is a good opportunity to test different things with this audience, get feedback from your most diehard fans, and then be able to implement that into what we're seeing in the normal Pro Tour. Right now, I think what's going on is differences are just because of who's running it. Like we have people running it that are more passionate, they're doing different stuff, whatever. And that's what's causing these differences. But I think this is an opportunity for the Pro Tour to be like, hey, the viewers really liked the OB stakes just being white. And there wasn't these banners all lining OB and the course's natural beauty could come through. How can we implement that? So I think that the issue isn't necessarily the differences, but the issue is that the differences aren't intentional. They're just kind of a byproduct instead of, and the Pro Tours reacting to them instead of being proactive and being able to use those to then shape the future of disc golf. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, I can see the idea of using that as a testing grounds. And and you're right, the 
there's always going to be the way that tournaments are being put on right now. There's always going to be that stark difference based on who is running it. Um, just because of the hand of the pro tour has, or doesn't have in each event. Um, Dustin rounded out for us. What are your thoughts on this European event, uh, style and how it's playing out? I mean, the truth is it's a good product. It's a great product in a lot of ways and, and disc golf pro tour. And we all would fail if we stopped learning, you know, one of the things we should always do, we should always observe when we see something that's better than the way we're doing it now and be willing to adapt and grow. But I would hate for it to see just be a carbon copy. One of the cool things about sports to me, and especially like you think the major league sports here in America is the stadiums, you know, stadiums around the country, they all have different feels. They all have different looks. They all have different structures. There's things about them that it shows their independence and they also represent the region they're in. Sometimes we think we get tired of our courses and we think about our courses not being very attractive because some of them are dirty. They need to be cleaned up, but also we see them all the time. Uh, it's the course we go, I got a course down the street. I go play on all the time and I'm kind of tired of it. But when people come to town, they're like, oh, y'all got an amazing course right here. It's like, okay, we do. I have to remind myself, we do have these amazing courses and we do have these great things. Uh, and, and it should represent the region and the towns and stuff like that it's a part of. Now, in saying that, I do think the Pro Tour needs to have a set of standards for their tournaments. Uh, things like how you're going to mark the out of bounds, how you're going to do tee pads. I think having some uniformity there would help just bring it all together. But the course itself, they should stand out on their own and bring something different each and every place. But there shouldn't be any question when you're looking at the screen and you're going, that's for sure out of bounds. That's for sure a hazard area. All that stuff should be pretty straightforward and not have to be a puzzle to figure it out. That's a really good point, uh, Dustin. I do, I do agree that, you know, as much as we we cry out for this consistency in product, we you still do want each course to have its own flavor. You mentioned the major league ballparks kind of situation, and really in every sport, you get something like that. Um, and it's certainly in golf. You know, if you look at the Waste Management Open compared to the Masters, compared to the British Open, every event, though there are certain standards in play, and actually different governing uh, bodies sometimes running them. Um, you know, there's still a set standard. As as far as what excellence looks like at those events, but they have very different looks. How, how did baseball get away with that? It's an old sport, man. That they, sounds, were, that, they were doing crazier never, things than I've <laughs> never thought about that, but literally it's get away with, with what, like the different fences. It's literally like, Oh, you're going and playing, you're, you're playing the Patriots this, this week. Oh, don't, don't run the ball the on the right side. The, oh, right, the, yeah. the, the field comes in on the right. Oh, you're going and playing Miami. <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. It's 130 yards. Yeah, like I, I've never thought about that, but baseball—that's kind of crazy that their their ballparks well, are. It's not just different. And listen to this. Different. Yeah, and listen to this. Well, the it all comes down to the I, baseball is sold on the idea that you're both playing at the same field, you know. But teams will design like the Baltimore Orioles, yes. my team. The example is they recently took. Um, a spot in left field and moved it back because their ballpark was too home run friendly. They were yeah. giving up too many home runs. Their pitching stunk, and they're like, "We're gonna make it harder to hit home runs." Yeah. And so they moved their a, wall back. Is that a strategy to like, if you, if some you people just have want, a short porch in you left want field, guy to like, you want a guy on your team to just break all the home run records? To just like every home <laughs> yeah. game, it's like, well, we're Bond. all, we're well, all Barry Barry Bond did it Barry in a tough Bond. stadium it's because different. in San Francisco they have, you know. In left, it's not too bad, but like no, I thought they were. I thought it was one of the shorter stadiums. Did not I, I, they have a really tall wall in right in right field? Um, and I believe he was he a lefty batter or a righty batter? He was, lefty, he was, he was lefty, a lefty, so he was hitting towards that tall field in right. I'm not sure how short it is. I mean, they do hit balls all the way into the short, bay, Trevor. I think it's short. Yeah, yeah it might be. But hit, like he's hitting can, kayakers. Well, out like there. in Tampa Bay in left field, they have like a little spot. <laughs> down the line where their fence gets like to like three feet high practically like yeah everything and obviously the green monster it's weird how did they get away with that what do you mean, I mean no, because the argument of like they oh we all have to play the same thing you can say that about a football field we have to both play on this football field yeah but no football field is like they should st they should start doing no. that with uprights in football you should have field goal posts that are different widths <laughs> yes but they've got the like Miami ballparks Dolphins. They got ballparks with different things, but everyone gets upset when Tom Brady lets a little air out of a ball. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> hey, come on. hey, they used to play no. football at Oakland on the baseball field, so that's that was true. something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Dolphin Stadium down there in Miami, it's uh they said early games in the season, one the home the home sideline is like ninety five degrees. Yeah, and the visitor sideline is like hundred and thirty. Because yeah. so they positioned it where the sun would just be right yeah. over the visitor. There's little home. definitely little nuances in every <laughs> sport, like and some even in hockey, they'll say some places have faster ice than others just based it's on just the temperatures the they keep the, it at. 
the dimensions being different is the crazy yeah, that's crazy. thing. That, that, yeah. Yeah, that is weird. Because in, in hockey, they'll if your team isn't super fast, they'll purposely sometimes keep the temperature yeah. different to make the ice softer because then you won't be going as fast. They'll do that in football too. Like they won't cut the grass. You know, they'll keep yeah. the grass super long if they want to try to even out the play. Maybe disc golf is just ahead of the curve with well, the no, I think I think this is the biggest argument against golf courses. We just uncovered it. Of I okay. think it's hard for local communities to get behind when the pro tour comes in town and goes to a golf course, because like, imagine the pro tour comes to North Carolina, like the home of woods golf. We take a lot of pride in the, like the Southeast area, right. Of woods golf. That's what we're known for. And like, they just went to a wide open golf course and it might as well be Vegas. Like, you're <laughs> right, be way them. Less excited than like, Oh, we get to see the pros take on. Like you just mentioned iron Hill top of the, like top of the hour. Like yep. when people come and play Iron Hill, it's like, oh, the pros get to take on what we're known for here. Yeah. Versus, oh, sick. It's a I, it's going so down. Much, I wish it was so much easier to film in the woods and so much harder to film in the um, on golf course. It doesn't necessarily have like the mm -hmm. West Coast, like there, there's different styles of golf that I think, like if you went to, uh, obviously, you go to Myrtle Bela, Beach, you expect to be on a, on a golf course. Better man. be on the sand. Like... <laughs> yeah, better be on a golf course. That's true. We go to Florida, Olympus should be on a golf course. Yeah. Uh, no, but if you go to, like, uh, if you go out west to De La, right? Obviously, De La has different. There's the course I wouldn't really design, say that's a wooded course, though. The course is, but it, but it has the like low trees and stuff like if you were able to turn that into a pro level course distance wise oh, and everything sure. to where right, like copy you can the, have the, the geography throw over, yeah like throw over the, right. the trees and different like the aspects that makes it feel like this is a southern california course mm -hmm. like if i go to colorado versus... i expect to see some mountains that, exactly. well, that's that's what i think we are missing out on is like disc golf can be played in a lot of areas that mm -hmm. golf can't and it, we're kind of shying away from those areas. urban disc golf next, mm -hmm. next urban disc golf future <laughs> bring, bring back the texas golf. desert courses yeah for real oh the skips in dallas are crazy yeah it's just <laughs> so slide forever. In hand. Uh, or texas right. mud we're gonna move on uh <laughs> to our next topic this is a pretty big one that just dropped um kevin jones he has left prodigy mid-season just came out of nowhere all of a sudden we got a post from kevin post from prodigy shortly after so i'm just leaving it up to you here what do you suspect will happen next and why the mid-season move what's your read on this situation and what have you gathered did it surprise you i just want to hear your reaction gary you know the wordings of these posts are really interesting it feels a lot less like hey guys i'm leaving and more like you can't fire me i'm leaving um, but you know, this isn't the KJ of old who had the solid performances signed to a four year contract extension, which made sense back then because the market was strong and there was money and flowing into disc golf. However, the last year or so has not been friendly for KJ. 2023 wasn't terrible, but this year it feels like he's almost non existent. You know, his average finish of 50th place, top finish of 20th, and 73rd rank on the tour. You know, to me, it feels like there had to have been some sort of like stability clause in the contract, which wouldn't be a shocking thing because, you know, back then, even that short time ago, a four year deal was a longer deal in disc golf. Um, so it's probably a combination of, of performance and sales. And, you know, newsflash to people, it's not just performance on the course um, that brings value to a team. You can do it with sales as well. And Prodigy already really struggles to sell their discs. But for me, I think we have to look a bit closer here um, at KJ himself because he isn't as popular as he used to be. He's appeared in less than half of the OTB skins matches that he did back when they first started. Yes, I counted them all. Um, and he's doing more DJing, which I honestly hope that's not what he's leading for. I've been to see him live and all 10 intoxicated people there seem mildly entertained by his music. I, um, <laughs> I think that he's fallen a little out of love with the game and maybe he should get rid of some of his uh, recreational habits on the side and get back to being a true athlete again. Uh, but for the future, I'm sensing maybe an open bag to return to his roots. Um, and any brand looking to pick him up should probably just put the money back in their pockets and talk to Gavin Rathbun instead. Oh, I like that. Calling out, calling out the boy Gavin Rothbaum. Not a great DJ. Uh, Gary said it first. Um, Hunter, what do you think is going on in this Kevin Jones situation? Uh, we really are opening ourselves up to the first debate night curse here because there's a solid chance that when we record this on Tuesday night to when we release this on Wednesday yeah. night, everyone watching this is going to know exactly what happened to Kevin Jones. <laughs> but just a reminder, we don't right now. So we're yeah. speculating. You might know we don't, but that can be fun. You can laugh at us. All right, just use 15 seconds for nothing. Here we go. I've been hearing Innova, which is crazy to me, but I'm going to just act like I haven't heard that because that just seems so far-fetched that Kevin Jones might be going to Innova midseason. They don't really 
I don't know. It just doesn't line up with me. In my opinion, I really do expect him to go open bag. He did allude to staying um, in disc golf in a response to a comment on his Instagram post because someone said something of like, hope you don't leave. And he's like, oh, you think I'm going somewhere? Just wait. Big announcement coming soon. So he does at least allude to staying in disc golf, which is a good sign. Um, but I'm expecting him to go open bag mainly because when he was gaining popularity, when he was having some like breakout tournaments at USDGC and stuff, he was with pro discus and that was a mixed bag. He was crushing destroyers. and I think bosses and stuff back then. Um, and so I expect the mixed bag to be the play. He's already with OTB, probably stay with them. I think the reason behind this is I think probably just needed a fresh start. I think that he hasn't been forming up to the expectations, whether contract contractually or just in general, um, from prodigy and this is leading to him just kind of wanting to find the spark again for himself if you're prodigy you're cool with this because you are most likely overpaying him since you signed him in 2021 when he was bigger and the sport was in a much different spot and if you're kevin you like this because now we all know there's nothing like uh nothing to reignite the fire like finding an old disc or grabbing a brand new disc and getting out there with something you haven't thrown in years so this could be something that really lights a fire in him but i think he's going mixed bag Mixed bag. Okay. Another vote for, for mixed bag potentially here. Um, Dustin, are you getting a similar read on this? What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I'm going to pull this one out of my pocket here because I think I missed the memo that we were changing the questions. So, uh -oh. um, when it comes to the KJ, um, you know, fellow Arkansan, you know, my, my heart goes out to him. It, every time I've seen KJ on videos or in, in things, it seems, seems like an emotional guy. He seems like a guy who, who has strong beliefs, can get pretty on track with something in his mind, probably his thoughts. And something tells me that there might have been a situation. His life's been changing a lot. He made a big move to the Carolina. I think he's getting married or has gotten married recently. I think those are all stuff that's going in his life. And when those life changes happen, man, it gets you to start thinking about a lot of things. And I think that's probably what he's doing. Uh, I think he's probably gotten really frustrated with his game this year. He's been disappointed on where he's at in the rankings and his finishes. And I think he just feels this needs a time for a change to ultimately – maybe to further his career and to prolong his career uh, versus just walking away from it. And I feel like maybe, just maybe, he reached out to Prodigy and Prodigy said, hey, you know, they're not really probably reaping a lot of benefits for paying him a good amount of money through that contract. And maybe it was just a mutual agreement for them to both part ways. That's purely speculation on my part. I don't know the insides and it's hard to predict, but I think just mostly those life changes have probably got him going in a new direction and it's different, just different way of thinking. As far as where he's going, I don't see signing any type of contract here in the middle of the season. I think open bag for the rest of the year, then, then kind of see what he's feeling, see what he likes, and then maybe next next season, if he still feels passionate about it, come back with a new sponsor or a new bag. Okay, another for, for new or uh, for mixed bag. I, Dustin, I apologize on the question update. I, I updated it like probably 25, 30 minutes after I sent the script. I just figured nobody was dedicated enough to have already studied it, but I, I got Dustin You're all wrong. wrong. Yeah, Less man. learned. <laughs> I write them down so I can just have them on my desk at work. Oh, uh, there you go. So, Printed yeah. it out. Put I it know. Bed, no. Meditated. No, out. that's that's on me. I I I will not make that uh, mistake again. But hey, you should just rolled with your <laughs> other argument and just. See what <laughs> yeah, <happened>. I don't <laughs> even remember what the other question was, but it was apparently it was the last on my docket because I'm like, well, Kevin Jones would be more interesting. Um, all right, Brody, what are you thinking about this Kevin Jones situation? Any any differing opinion? Well, the first thing I'm going to say is the amount of speculation I just heard out of you three is disgusting. Um, I can't believe you. Uh, I had a lot more respect for you guys, and the speculation that I'm hearing from you is just, it saddens me greatly. Uh, with that being said, um, yeah, looking at kind of his last several posts and kind of going through it, it definitely feels like he is on, and he even says he's on this roller coaster of where he's talking about, Super excited for an event, and then the event ends, and then it's like back to the drawing board. And I've been there too, of where it's like you start feeling good about your game, and then you don't actually play well, and you're like, "All right, well, let me try something else." The and he gets engaged on May 9th, and then on June 3rd, he doesn't post for a while, and then on June 3rd, he makes a post, pretty lengthy post of him like running and jumping into a waterfall. And the post is very much like, my life is awesome. I get to play disc golf. I'm super grateful. Kind of like reflecting on it doesn't really matter whether I play well or don't play well. I still have a great life type of thing. Um, then he finishes the next term, I think Portland Open with like a middle of the pack. He's like, um, he actually doesn't even have a recap on that tournament, which is is 
different than past tournaments. And then we get the goodbye post. The one thing that no one mentioned that I thought was interesting, and I'll end on this, his contract did not end this year. His contract right. went all the way through 2026, yeah. which to me, that's something happened because I could see ending it this year. I know I'm taking too much time. I'm sorry. But I could see if it ended this year being like, ah, you know, they, they didn't really want to resign them. They were talking about it. It was going to work that way. They felt like they should split ways a year and a half. That's a really long time. It is to just say like deuces. Um, so yeah, I don't really know. Hopefully we get more exit. information. That's that's why I said it had to be some kind of a stability clause because I I can't find a reason why Kevin Jones if he's getting paid I'm, well goes to Prodigy and says hey guys I'm I just want to get out yeah I'm hearing from my source and this is a pretty good source not not like directly involved but there's a spec there's there's some suggesting that there could have been a a clause pertaining to world rankings um that, oh, that that gave prodigy an option to back out that's that's the only thing I've world rankings and he's just frozen in history. <laughs> which i also yeah, i will yeah, say if there's, up. Sorry. if there's any truth to that like putting a clause involving the ranking system is crazy i can <laughs> see also there might be something in there too on the lines of like hey this is what we're expecting from you not just like playing yeah. wise but maybe social media wise and mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. and you know, it's one of those things of where players, when they when they uh, sign a crappy contract and they're worth a lot more now, a year or two later, they're trying to find every single, we've seen it multiple times. And a lot of times, a lot of the players just call the, the company's bluff and says, I'm leaving, try to sue me. And sometimes well, yeah. they do and sometimes they don't. And, let's... And, and now I think we're seeing it on the other side too, where the mm -hmm. manufacturers are being like, Right. Well, we have this stuff. We can basically say deuces to you early, well, so we don't have to pay you. Yeah, let's not forget that Prodigy is ruthless. I mean, they sued their best player. Um, so like they—they they were in the right there. I know. What were they supposed to do though? I'm just saying. Yeah. I know. Yeah, I'm not saying they're. I'm not saying they're meanie heads. I'm just saying they're ruthless in the ruthless. sense that. I'm, yeah, ruthless in the sense that if they They're see an, an opportunity, business. I wouldn't they, say that's they, ruthless though. Is like you have someone that's trying to leave. Yeah, but, I wouldn't say I'm not saying ruthless in like a bad context. Contract. Ruthless is in like if you violate them or if you do something wrong, they, hold you they will hold you to it. That's what I mean by I say ruthless. So I they're get, accountable. They're a real they business. Have integrity. <laughs> All right, guys, so they, should so we do a little? So, shall we do a little? So ruthless? they're a legit company. They have a, they have a legal team. <laughs> So they actually, um, they actually have ruthless lawyers ruthless definition that look over their contract. Having no pity, merciless. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. They have no pity. They're merciless. Yep. You, didn't, you didn't post six times this month on Instagram? Merciless. Yep. You're gone. This, <laughs> with extra, this with extra flashing for you. No, yeah, here's, <laughs> here's the thing. Is a new show called Ruthless Speculation? Yeah. <laughs> if, I know a lot of contracts have, like in disc golf, had certain – social media like you're required to post X oh yeah a month, or you so have much. to tag us you have to use a specific hashtag and as silly as that sounds like a lot of players don't do it because why like oh i forget one post to put hashtag blah 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 foundation discs right mm -hmm. well that is a breach of contract at right. the end of the day and right. so like you can just throw something in there like that and at the end of the day it's like well what are you gonna do Here's People 17 are, posts you didn't do it on. So. Yeah, they're going to let it. Everything's going to be let slide when you're playing awesome and they love you and they're selling discs. But as soon as you're not, they might start looking at that. What are we writing that contract? Yeah, what, but a what ranking, are we put in there? A rankings clause, which would make sense, is also crazy. This like, is that's where... Just, that's ludicrous. Imagine, no wonder, I mean, I wouldn't play good. Imagine the pressure. Yeah. You see it slip and it's like, if you drop outside top 50, I'm at 49th going that's into nuts. the next event. It's like, oh, no. Yeah, that's this nuts. Is, this is where, too, it's really interesting to see how companies move forward because, I mean, if you remember when they signed that extension, they went like, we're coming out with multiple discs, multiple molds. And it's not just smacking his, you know, his logo on a disc that's Prodigy. Yeah, it's like connecting with discs. the whole music and all that stuff. That's they a jumped, lot of that's a lot of money to they put jumped into on something. board the Kevin Jones uh, hype train and and like yeah to, for Kevin you know I feel bad because he had everything in front of him in disc golf he was the next big thing mm -hmm. he had this brand people loved him and he's still a likable enough guy like I'm not sure but he just kind of fell off a bit and we'll see I, I hope he can turn it around he's a guy that if he were to turn it around people would root for that a, great a lot story great yeah it'd be, story. A, it'd be a really good story so I, I hope I wish the best for him um, all right we're gonna move on we got a fan submitted topic here. Um, little disc golf rules theory here. Somebody asked a question about circle one. So 
This fan wanted to know, do you think we should evolve the meaning of circle one to allow it to take any shape or size to allow more than just a 10 meter circle, similar to greens in traditional golf? If you land on the green, you have to play by circle one rules, no jumping um, and displaying balance and such. So now we're having this idea of the, the, the circle can be whatever you want it to be. It can take any shape or size uh, based on the course. Hunter, how do you think this would apply to the sport? Does it make any sense? I am a fan of this for the pro tour. Um, I don't think obviously you want this to apply to the sport as a whole because we've seen some elevated baskets and stuff that local C tier TDs can do. I, I don't want to give them control over what greens are. Uh, I mean, things could get, things could get crazy and dicey. I mean, we might, we might have it the other way where people are jump putting from 10 feet because it's like, well, who cares? Um, so I think on the pro tour though, I like this idea. Um, because I think this allows for more creative course designs and for course designers to really be able to challenge players in unique ways. I think it could also like open up the opportunity to have all this par three all be in circle one to where you can't jump putt at all. So it enhances the importance of the drive on that hole um, in a different way to difficulty. You could also have some greens like extend 150 feet wide to the right. So you players have to decide do they like attack the water to the left a little bit more to have the ability to jump putt if they mess up like they make sure they leave it left or you have players just going right only problem with this whole idea which is great in theory but here's where the problem comes in not all players use step or jump putts so you're going to be penalizing only some players so you have guys like gannon burr threw a putt no not jump putt didn't move from 110 feet at beaver state fling to get up and down on an island just spun the thing 110 feet so like to that guy who cares if he has to step, putt, jump, putt, whatever. But then a, a different player, jump, putt, Jones, or, you know, James Conrad, step, putt. Well, now if that's 60 feet, now you have Ricky and Gannon have even a bigger advantage over guys who rely on the step, putt. that's where it all falls apart. But I'm all for the idea. I think it'd be fun. Yeah. Okay. That's that. Yeah. That's an interesting thought um, with some players having that advantage, some not um, necessarily as much. Um, Dustin, what do you think about this, this green change? Would it make any sense? Okay, I went on a bit of, little bit of a roller coaster when I first read this because I was like, that's kind of a neat idea. I like how golf courses have different, you know, shapes on their putting surfaces. I like how the, you know, the, the different hills and the different breaks that you can do. I mean, I like all that stuff. And I thought, well, this could be a fun idea. You could shape it around some trees. Or you could do this. And then I saw that word any, and I'm like, with the word any, heck no, you can't just say, I'm going to allow you to shape the green however you want because, I mean, like you said, one side could be two feet and you can have somebody step putting from five feet away. It doesn't make any sense. Or you can have a 90-foot putt over here. I, there have to be some limitations on it, but I'm still not a big fan. And I'm totally against what Hunter just said as far as I'm. he was okay with the idea on the Pro Tour. I am not okay with the idea on the Pro Tour because here's why. I don't want a totally different game when it comes to what the pros are playing to what we're playing. Now, would it would it change that much? Maybe not, depending on what they do with the greens, but it could change a lot. If they want to extend the green, uh, maybe like to 60 feet, 50 feet, I don't know what that magic number is for the professional tour. I'm fine with that uh, because like in the NBA, you have a three-point line that's a little bit further back. We're still trying to jack up threes, even though the amateurs from half court, but you, you understand that because it's the, still the same idea. It's just a little bit more difficult. So I can see extending the putting for that, but beyond that, I mean, what is – what does changing the circle do for you besides give you the ability to step put? I mean, you don't have to worry about a break on the ground. You don't have to worry about going around the house. You just, you just throw things. And just because you're behind the tree, you just still have to throw around the tree. It doesn't matter how big the green is. Fair points. Fair points. Um, yeah, it, it's tough to say, you know, how much versatility does that give course designers and what are the things they can do with it? Um, Brody, what are your ideas here? What do you think about it? Well, I think, I think Hunter and Dustin actually kind of both, I mean, you guys answered the question, but I think the question and your guys' answers kind of miss what the actual benefit of shaping greens would do. And that would be like the statistics and actually show who has the most control over their disc right now. A lot of times players are literally just trying to throw the disc as close as possible to the basket. There's very few holes. Do we, that we ever like, ah, we want to make our, we want to miss right. We, we don't want to throw left of the basket. Very few holes. Um, I would love, I think doing something like this, we would be able to see, okay, who actually was landing in the right zones. Now, again, this would only really make sense for a couple holes. There are some holes we play where if you're left of the basket, you're in a bunch of trees, you're not going to have a clean putt. Um, to me, no one should be trying to aim over there. So if you land in the right side of the basket, you're going to have a wide open putt. 
I would love to see that where right now in statistics, both those people hit C1 in regulation, which one person actually threw it where they were trying, one person didn't. Now, where this all falls apart is we can't even get the Disc Golf Pro Tour, the volunteers or whoever to put six little things in the ground to make a circle for us. So how the heck are we expecting them to do this? This seems like way above anything that we've ever seen. That's what I was waiting for somebody to mention is the implications of marking the greens is definitely, uh, it doesn't even happen with what we have right now, but I do, I do think that's, that's a good angle. The stat keeping, you know, thing, cause you're right. You know, sometimes you can be inside of circle one or circle two in regulation and be in a, not a good spot. Yeah. It would allow those more protected greens to draw a green that actually paints a better picture of uh, a, a well-thrown shot. Um, all right, Gary, you've had to digest these answers. What are your thoughts on this concept? You don't seem like you like it. Uh, simple answer. No, I, I think it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a cool idea in theory, but in practice, I don't think it would hold up very well. I, I, we already struggle with statistics. I mean, how would you be able to fairly determine what C1 would be in those cases? Cause most of our tour courses don't offer a lot of flexibility because they aren't private courses. Um, we also don't want a world where you can be 10 feet from the basket and be in C2. Would there even be a C2? Is this like a green is the green and that's it kind of scenario? Um, I think a big difference also between golf and disc golf greens is the importance. The green for golf does a lot more for the sport than the green and disc golf does for the sport. A 30-foot putt in golf is a thousand times harder than a 30-foot putt in disc golf. And but, you know, with the surface, the slope, and the upkeep, it just matters way more in golf than disc golf. It does start a good conversation, though, of what can we do in C1 to make things better. And I think one of my favorite things is if you look at like what the Portland Open does, with how they use some like the slight mounds and stuff it forces you to consider your entry angle and your entry speed with your shots you can put ob in front of the green to add difficulty don't just put ob behind the green we've talked about that before use guarded stuff in the greens to make things more interesting and maybe use some kind of material to shake up the bullseyes a little bit um, I think the big thing is just how do we force players to make decisions? You know, when a green's wide open, it takes the touch out of the game. And while it's fun to see pros throw the big shots and not care about where it lands, it's more entertaining to see the, the person throw the shot that beats the OB, matches the angle of the green. I think we keep the circles the same. Let's just make the courses better. I, um, you know, I, I really like that point. And I, I think that what happens is, like you mentioned, Gary, because the green in disc golf is so less important. Um, I think in the eyes of course designers, it can become an afterthought. But if you think about some of the most iconic shots in disc golf and what they all have in common, think of hole 17 at USDGC. Why is that so great? Well, it's because of the green hay it's, bales. it's, it's one of, yeah, they use the hay bales. They also make it. That's like one of the only shots in disc golf you see often where players are purposely bailing long, right? Because why it's a wider section of the green, the green forces you to think through your shot. You mentioned the, the Hills that they use, um, on golf courses. It all of a sudden makes a 150 foot up shot a heck of a lot harder because you're thinking I can't just spike this in next to the basket. It's going to roll away. I think course de designers would benefit a lot thinking through, you know, every single hole is an opportunity to add something to a green. You know, just just a little something. Is it a slope? Um, is it a different part of terrain? Is it um, a, a bush that might be near the basket? You know, players get really fed up on their stuff near the basket. But I do think there's always more opportunity there because it does it. Like you mentioned, it makes it so much more exciting when you have an upshot. You know, in golf, it's not it's like until that ball is in the hole or at least within three feet of the hole, unless you're Rory McIlroy, it's it's still very exciting up into that point because every shot takes a lot of skill to execute. If you give a, a, a disc golfer 120 feet at a basket, they're getting up and down 100 percent of the time unless there is danger around. And that takes it almost gets to a point like if you've ever played a par three disc golf course, that's pretty easy. You get to a point where if you throw your drive and you don't have a birdie putt, you feel like it's pointless. You're like, I'm just going to hop up here, chuck this thing very easily under the basket, tap out par. There's not a lot more to think about. And I think that disc golf could benefit to make those shots matter a little bit more. Um, yeah. I, I, gotta, oh, I, wanna, go ahead, go I was just going to have Brody clarify something. Cause I think Brody uh, brought up, in my opinion, the best point of, that keeping wise where like if there's danger let's say there's danger 20 feet left of the basket no one's aiming for that but if i land in there i have a 25 foot putt i still have a c1 in regulation hit so if we were to change that right to where the green or circle one like cut that part out 
would there how would the rules be affected would the rule of like step putting you think still stay the same to where i still can't step putt there even though i'm not in circle one or would like that 25 footer in that scenario now be able to step putt or like you know what i'm asking the step i think it's important for stats but like what does it do rules wise yeah no i see what you're saying because like in in that scenario right if you're if you've got but I think it's easier if you think about like a tree barrier. So you have a yeah. bunch of trees 20 feet away from the basket. Your disc is behind there. You now theoretically, you're outside of circle one. So you now theoretically could like fall forward around the trees and putt. So I think you would have to honestly change the rule completely to where there would be a C1, a C2, and then C3. And you could only putt, uh, step right. putt, jump putt. Outside and then, because it, yeah, and, and the tricky the thing is, and right? you mentioned it, Brody, is like if if that's the case, if you had that scenario, then at that point, the green only exists for stat keeping. Correct. Um, and like trying to get somebody to do that is just ludicrous. Yeah. Like, and who's going to spend that much time designing this green around just stat keeping? Nobody. No. That's who. Yeah. And um, what I was going to say too, just to add on to what you were saying a little bit, is when we had Gannon on, who. Right now, I think we can all agree is one of the top, if not the top players in the world. The best. It was very, uh, very apparent when he said, I was talking about some of the course designs that I would like to see courses do, which is one of them is force carries of Mm -hmm. where there's no more of this. Just throw the disc as far as you can. If it only goes 50 feet or 150 feet or 200 feet or three, it doesn't matter. Just get it as far as you can start creating these massive gaps of where if you land in this massive gap, you're OB. Right. And so now players are going to have to think, and it's kind of like what Gary was saying too, is like, don't just put OB behind the basket, put OB in front because now you have to think like, okay, my miss is long. Okay. So now players are going to throw 40 feet past the basket. And now they have to think, do I want to try to run that putt with the OB right behind now? Or, you try to get dicey and try to just get one. You have to think more. And Gannon said, when we were literally talking about this, he's like, I don't want to see that happen. And I was like, why? He's like, because then I would actually have to make decisions. And that, <laughs> scare, and that scares me. And well, it's like, also you, you have the hundred miles an hour too. <laughs> I was like, you have the best player in the world at a sport telling you that they don't want to do something. Cause it's scary. What all of us as fans, what do we want to see happen? He's a teenager we, too. <laughs> we want, but we want to see players that are good, like be challenged and yeah. be put in tough spots. I think OB short of the baskets is one of like the most underutilized tools. Well, think you, of, think of hole six in new London. Like think yeah. of how much that hole changes. If you don't have that OB just shy. Yeah. Like if you're, if you're, and that hole would be totally out, fine if you didn't have it, but it makes it infinitely more second, talented. Your second, everyone's second shot would just be chucking it as far up there as possible if there was no OB. Well, short I'm saying that even hole. attacking the green right now, if you're slightly out of position, it makes you think all oh, the time. I was stuff. talking, I was talking about hole seven. Sorry. No, yeah, six. I'm saying hole, six. Hole seven, same way though. Same hole way. seven, you would just, your second shot, you would just chuck. And yeah. then also your third shot wouldn't really, or your second shot, if there was no OB there, wouldn't really matter that much mm-hmm. because you're yeah. always going to go for it. Where now we know on hole seven, your second shot matters so much. Cause if you're out of position, that, that shot over there is weird. I see. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's a no brainer. It's something that we need to have because we don't have rough, we don't have greens, we don't have anything to protect and make players have to make decisions. And mm-hmm. that's the easiest one mm-hmm. is just make players have to make decisions and stop putting like OB super close to the basket unless it's short of the basket, right? Because if it's short of the basket, you don't get an advance. But if you have OB just left of the basket, guess what? You go OB, tap in. You have OB right of the basket, go OB, tap in. Behind the basket, OB tap in. Right. Those should all be hazards. Make yeah. them freaking go out there and make your putt with your extra penalty stroke. Maybe yeah. hazards yeah. should be a half a stroke. Dark yeah. Whoa. Oh, there you half go. strokes. Half <laughs> strokes. <laughs> we round Holy up cow. or down. What happens I'd probably there? have a half stroke trying to c- calculate my score if we had those. Um, all right. Think, what is it, Gary? I, I was just say, I think there's a lot that also can be learned from the study. I, I looked into how greens are designed in golf. It was a very fascinating like place to go into. A lot could be learned, I think, from people on the tour designing courses to try to understand why things are done on a golf course because mm-hmm. it's so intentional. It's Everything an art is fun, and it's yeah. amazing, and we, we could learn something from that. It, it's true. It, yeah, you're not kidding. I mean, the, 
it looks really simple, but every little slope leading towards the fairway bunker or this or that, like it is every part of the top topography of a, like a high level golf course is thought through so specifically to make it play a certain way. There's I also, mean, you look at that U S open course, we just saw every single slope on that course is meant to do a certain thing and it. And it's evil, but there's um, also like bad golf course designers. Yeah. And mm -hmm. like people will say like this course sucks. Yeah. Happens in every, that everything doesn't really um, happen that often in disc golf, though. Yeah, a lot of times we don't know who the designer <laughs> is. It does happen. It's just that someone but, went out and put a tee pad in a basket and forgot to clear anything in between. <laughs> well, I'm saying no. I'm saying for like uh, we're not. We don't really say if we don't like the Portland Open, we just say hey, we don't like the Portland Open. We yeah. don't go. This person designed it. We need to stop letting this person design. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. We don't All really right. know. Yeah, true. All right, we're going to move into our final topic here. So as we move into this later part of the season, things are moving along. We are already in mid-June. Um, your eyes start to kind of wander towards the, the playoff standings a little bit. It's starting to become more and more difficult to make that cut now. So I want to know, as we head back east for the final swing of the season, which MPO player are you most surprised to see outside of the Tour Championship cut line and uh, that top 32, that is, and how uh, do you think they will be able to sneak in before the season ends? Cause there are quite a few names sitting out there as it stands that you would probably have a little bit of surprise about Dustin. What is your name? What comes to mind? Yeah. So I took a look at the list and at first I was like, why are we asking this question? Cause I don't see very many names on here that I'm surprised is outside the 32 because it seemed like a lot of the people I knew were up there where they should be right now. I did see Kevin Jones way down there. We already talked about him. I just felt bad for him. Probably goes back to that question, but the one name that stood out, to me, for sure, was Eagle McMahon. Uh, right now, it looks like he was sitting at 49th, <clears throat> which is still pretty close to 32. He's only 82 points behind uh, 32nd place. And, I mean, that's the name that I'm a little surprised by because I thought he was going to start off this season a little bit harder, uh, hotter than he has. I know he's still dealing with the injury. I knew that was going to be a factor. Changing discs, companies, you know, it takes a while to learn that stuff. But Eagle, Eagle's the guy I have the most confident in doing that. Uh, now, whether or not he can make it, I think completely, yes, he can. I mean, he's just starting to show that he's coming back to form a little bit in his first top 10 finish this year. Uh, and we have a lot of tournaments out there still to play that can get him a lot of points. You got two playoffs. Uh, you got two majors going on. I think playoff, if you win a playoff, is 150 points. If you win uh, the majors, 200 points. So there's still a lot of points that he can give. And Eagles, that one guy above 32, I say, can still go out and win any one of these tournaments when he's on top of his game. He's playing there. I can't say that about everybody else. So I could see him finishing really high several several um, of the tournaments, maybe even win a few, maybe even pop off a major or something. I don't know. This is all assuming he stays healthy and stays uh, focused. I know he's been been challenged with that. But the dude's got all the talent in the world. He's got all the ability. He's got all the opportunity. I think he's the most likely to pass. Get yeah, I'd, I think it does. Obviously, he was out for a while, but I think it speaks to the competitiveness of the field now yeah. that even with some good finishes coming back, he wasn't able to just immediately hop back in. And like you mentioned, certainly a guy who could just gear up and get a win and be right back in there. But he's got work to do. You know, he's still points behind. Mm -hmm. And that top 32 is rock solid. Um Brody, what, what did you see? What are some names that, that pop into your head? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the fact that we've, we've we, you know, 5, 10, 15 years ago, you know, you have a bad weekend. You might still finish in the top 10, top 15. Now you miss a putt on hole 18, you're dropping 10 spots, right? So um, I think that has a lot to do with Eagle not being there. Obviously, he didn't play that many events this year either. So I'm not too worried about Eagle. The one that is surprising to me is actually Chris Clemens. Mm -hmm. um, I always viewed Chris Clemens as a top 20 guy. I thought that was a spot that you could always throw him in. Now, he's not going to be out there contending to potentially win tournaments. We haven't really seen that much from him. Um, but he's had some good finishes here and there. He's thrown his name in the hat once or twice. He went to Discraft this offseason, and I thought uh, that transition was going to be a good one. I thought he was going to be playing well. Now, I think we are headed towards more courses that are suited toward it to towards him. And I think that opens up a bigger discussion of, can you actually be successful as a left-handed player on tour? We don't really, I mean, he's the best that we got. We don't really see that many lefties uh, really doing that well. And you look at other sports, um, you know, lefty and uh, baseball, super advantage, lefty and tennis, super advantage, lefty and uh, ultimate Frisbee big advantage. I think it actually might not be a big disadvantage. I think a lot of holes are shaped 
for right-handed backhands, and it's a lot harder to throw that lefty forehand. Yeah, yeah, that's a. I, I've always thought that it's you know obviously we've got less lefties out there, but it's totally fair to say that course designers go in with a bias because most of them are right-handed throwers and most people some people might not know it but yes that left hand forehand a it's just more stressful on the body to throw it but it is it flies differently than a right-handed backhand it just does it's you're not going to get the same kind of rotation and speed on it um and that's just the way that shot works gary uh what's the name that's popping up for you a uh, quick FPO honorable mention shout out. Uh, I want to send out a lifeboat to Haley King, Maria Oliva, and Katrina Allen. Where are you at? Let us know if you need help. Um, but uh, <laughs> there are quite a few names that actually surprise me if you scroll down the tour standings. Uh, one of the quick ones that pops out is Bradley Williams. You know, he finished 19th place last year. He's sitting on the bubble at 33. He feels way too consistent to be outside the top 32. I think he'll get in there for sure. Corey Ellis is another big one. Um, surprise for me because he's coming off a season with a major win. He looked great in the, uh, the warm up tour in Australia. And I expected to see him competitive coming out the gate. And he kind of hasn't been. He's at 38th. Maybe he can fight his way in there. James Conrad, 44th. Where where has he been? What's going on? Um, I don't know. And then, like Brody said, our favorite lefty, Chris Clemens, at 56th. Normally, he's popped off by now. But the biggest name for me is Alden Harris. Uh, mm -hmm. He's in 40th place. He finished 13th last year. He has all the skills he needs. He has all the ability to have success at these courses. He hasn't changed brands. He's got it all. It's right there in front of him. Well, He's got some some difficulties, but the big one for me is he's surrounded by success. Look at his friend group. You've got Gavin Babcock at 18, Isaac Robinson at 11, Ezra at six, and Gannon at one. He's falling behind those around him. Um, I think if he doesn't have a couple decent events in the next two or three, barring a late season win, he could play himself out of the tour championship. Uh, that was my pick, Gary. I I think, you know, when you look at last season, he um he did not miss cash the entire year. Uh, he he was he had a great season. He seemed like next up and and really good point. He didn't he didn't even move companies. You know th this should have been another up a step forward for him or at least something similar. And it's been a disappointing season um, for Alden so far. So that I, I definitely agree with that one. That was one that really stood out for me. Not even being all the way up at that cut line, being back in fortieth is is crazy. Mm -hmm. um, Hunter, a lot of names mentioned so far. Which ones stand out to you? Look, I'm actually really proud of this pick because I knew I was going last. Okay, so I knew this is going to be tough. And yeah. then Gary started just naming them all. He just started <laughs> name dropping, and I was like, "He's just coming for me. He's coming. He's trying to take. He's trying to take every ounce of breath I have in my lungs." Good news is, I don't think he knew you could scroll as far as I scrolled to find this guy. Now, this player is coming off injury during last season. He struggled last year, but the reason I want to lean into this guy is because pretty much everyone else that was picked here they've got a pretty good chance of success the rest of the season, right? They're going into Alden Harris. He can pull things together. Chris Clements, he can pull things together. Like we get their the, the future's bright. Drew Gibson's future's behind him, right? Drew Gibson needed to get his points early in this season. If he wanted a chance of smelling the top 32 and he did not Not only did he not get his points, he's in 109th place. He's so far back that he's basically yelling in the top 32. I mean, Gary just scrolled down and didn't even see the guy's name. That's how far down he is. And he's just sitting on the outside. And that's what surprises me is because, look, I thought he got a lot of stuff fixed last year. You know, obviously he was going through different surgery, all this different stuff was going on. But if you look back the year before, he came out the gates hot. I mean, he's a former Pro Tour winner at multiple different tournaments he's already played, including Las Vegas Challenge and Portland, two that he's already went through. Obviously, Vegas didn't happen this year. But two tournaments that historically early in the season, that's where he gets in. And he's so far out that I don't even think he has a chance at getting in this season. I'd love to see him prove me wrong, but he's the guy kind of like Kevin Jones where high expectations didn't meet him. That's a really good pick, Hunt. I I didn't even I didn't scroll that far either when I was looking at this question. I and that's a good point. Care. Drew Gibson <laughs> is what did you say? I said I did. I just saw his name. I'm like, well, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he uh, he just hasn't uh, hasn't been playing very good disc golf. It seems oh. Drew Gibson, man, what what could have been? Maybe it, it's, it's a crazy. sprint to the finish line. Nice, thank you. Nice one. Wait, what was the joke there? Finish line it's disc. That's company. Oh, got him. <laughs> um, yeah, I the uh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't post a lot of disc golf. It seems like these days, you know. That that response was man of the people right there, Brody. <laughs> <laughs> he's like doing uh, the he's doing the opposite of what my haters say that i'm doing that i'm i'm clout chasing a disc golf he's he's doing the opposite he's going outside of disc golf now 
Hey man, just, when you get uh, bit by the golf bug, it's hard to it's hard to yeah, get away. Dude, Hunter's got it bad from right experience. now. Got Hunter's my got swing it. fix. Can't wait to get out the course Friday. <laughs> how many strokes it. am I giving you, Hunter? Are you giving me twelve? Like, how many strokes are you getting? Twenty five. Yeah, easily. Twenty five. Yeah, I think twenty five. I'd say if you if you rattle off a seventy five and he's around a hundred. I haven't I haven't hit a I haven't hit a golf ball. I, I think twenty five. I think yeah, twenty five. Courses out here that you're gonna be in mid to high seventies. Well, yeah. Unless yeah. we go to the freaking OB right the whole way course. That course sucks. I don't know what that was. The little nine hole course where it's just literally OB. Is it left? Is left. OB? left. left. Poplar. Okay. OB left everywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, nah, I've been playing London. Okay. Next time you're out here, I'll bring you. Break 100, bring it back. Bring it back. Bring it back. People want to see it. it. Comment down below to, if you want to see break 100. Comment down below. If we get if we get five comments, we'll bring it back. <laughs> we could. <laughs> yeah. I was like, if, if we, we get, get one if you comment smash with that, two likes, we'll smash get it back. that like button. Get one like on this video, we'll bring it back. Hunter <laughs> just wants to do all these expenses when he goes out to play golf. Hey man, just play some <laughs> one golf. That's a good throwback to old OG foundation people. <laughs> one uh, one episode would be electric. Just bring back break 100. Bring back. Give me one, one shot. Time. Just give him. He's hungry, man. He's hungry. <laughs> um, all right. We're going to move on to the finals. Gary Hunter. Close show today. Um, one point between them. Gary, would you like to go first or second? I will go second. I, well, Gary, what do you think your chances of victory are right now? Well, I mean, this is the first, uh, you know, it is what it is. I, I've been going second to Hunter all week because I get to listen to him uh, talk about these topics twice before we come into debate night. So I have to be all agile and stuff. So I'm in the agile mood. So I'll let him go first. Okay. Okay. Um, well, Hunter will go first. And I've got a pretty broad question here, but I I just wanted to hear everybody's take on this. So the question is, what area of our sport is most behind for its age? So I'm kind of looking like for relativity here when it comes to age. What's most behind for its age? And what area is most ahead for its age? Because sometimes we like to say positive things about the sport of disc golf, not just say the pro tour stinks and things like that. Um, so <laughs> I want to know what is most behind for its age and what is most ahead for its age? Hunter, what do you got? Well, when I was thinking most ahead first, the first thing that came to my mind is player contract values, but I didn't want to go with that simply because I think that that's going to right the ship, right? Like we we saw the spike happen. We saw a lot of massive contracts go out and then we're seeing that pull back. So I feel like that answer isn't going to hold true. The answer I do think that's going to hold true for most ahead is accessibility. Uh, I think because that's always been one of the biggest draws to disc golf. We have a low barrier to entry cost-wise, both on the equipment and on playing the course. Not 89% of our disc golf courses currently are free to play, to be exact, according to UDisc, which is crazy. Um, and on top of that, there's more disc golf courses in the U.S. than Duncan, also according, Duncan Donuts, that is, also according to uh, UDisc, which is a fun stat. And there's a lot more pickleball courts, technically. But the other thing that I want to attack here with the accessibility is with pickleball, you need someone to play with you. And also there's a lot less room for people on a pickleball court. If you have five pickleball courts to one disc golf court, you can fit a, or disc golf course, you can fit a lot of people on the one disc golf course versus the five pickleball court because there's 18 holes to spread out on. So um, accessibility, I think, is where for our sport we're most ahead. And I keep talking about pickleball because I discovered that pickleball was actually founded, discovered basically exactly the same time as disc golf, mid-1960s. Crazy. Um so where I think we're most behind, specifically looking at pickleball, is corporate sponsorships. If you look at pickleball, there's a lot of outside money being pulled in. Um, I saw like Michelob Ultra, Skechers is in there, obviously Franklin, um, and a lot of companies are making pickleball paddles that have nothing to do with pickleball, and they're rebranding stuff into pickleball. That's not really happening in disc golf. Most of the outside money from disc golf is coming from consumers purchasing the discs. So coming from our pockets, we are the outside money. So I think that's where we're most behind is the corporate sponsors, you know, spending money on the pro tour on advertising that'll allow the pro tour to really get the, the ball rolling and be able to grow the sport with that stuff. Yeah. It's really interesting that, um, you know, pickleball and obviously there's, there's differences in, you know, pickleball courts exist at the country clubs. There's a, there is a different demographic there, but at the end of the day, um, you know, disc golf is accessible. We did have a big boom, like however you want to say it, like there was a big boom in disc golf. And was there more opportunity to seize money from outside of the sport and bring it in? than we succeeded in doing Did disc golf focus too inward and just churn out plastic and not really think about marketing our sport better during that time. 
you know, only time will tell how much that comes back to bite us. Um, but I, I do think that's a, that's a valid point. And you're, and you're right. Accessibility at will always be, you know, that's our ace in the hole. That's the best thing disc golf will ever have going for it. Um, Gary, what do you think, um, where are we most ahead and most behind? I won't lie. This was a really super hard question. I love this question. Um, I think the areas that we're behind uh, for me are things like standardization uh, within our sport. Uh, our baskets and tee pads are the first things that come to mind. I mean, I could see an argument that like varying tee pads are good because you have like the different surfaces in tennis and different types of grass and golf. But when it comes to like length, width and how they're maintained, I think that's a big one. But baskets are the more egregious offense here because we have so much data between footage and professional expertise you feel like we should have been able to come up with a better basket by now another area that we're behind is established rules like we have a core set of concrete rules what other sport tweaks with the rules more than we do i mean uh, there are a lot of rules that don't make a lot of sense there are rules that are interpreted differently by different people there are rules that aren't enforced because we're a self-enforcing sport and um i i think the pga could literally come out with a brand new dumb rule next year and it'll somehow get passed like they could come out and they could say you can't bring snacks on the course unless you bring enough for your competitors and for some <laughs> reason that would get passed um i think another one big big one is like uh the marketing and the sponsorship acquisitions i don't think we do enough to attract sponsors um we don't position ourselves to get the big names involved and every time we do it feels like a one-off because we were close there with ll bean and barbasol which are great but how like what are we doing to go out and get more of that kind of stuff um, where are we advanced? Um, I think accessibility is a good one and that kind of ties into what I'm doing, but like we've always, it's always been a sport you can play by yourself. So whether or not we're advanced in that or I, or we've always been advanced as an argument there for me, it's uh, divert like the diversity of field because it's not a sport where there's one archetype of person who can do this. Um, like a lot of sports, it kind of seems like there's only one archetype that's really good at the sport. I think that we, you know, aren't just a group of one personal type. I think we have a, a wide array of backgrounds, ethnicities, body types, and ages. I mean, look, there's a, the how young is the best player in the world right now? Um, and as we continue to grow the sport in other countries, it's only going to continue more than ever before. I think the sport is accessible to just about anybody. Fair points, fair points, fair points. I got to be honest, I'm going to give the edge to Hunter today. I'm going to give the edge to Hunter. I think he got mm. you there, Gary. Got you at the end. Um, it wasn't, it was a tough question though. I, I wasn't sure what anybody would bring to the table, but yeah, I, I feel like the, um, argument that, cause I think, yes, the argument that the sport's always been accessible. I think that the argument of the diversity of the people that can play it is a similar thing where like, it's mm -hmm. always been that way. So I don't know. That's just what I thought. Hunter, Hunter brought the heat today. Interconnection, internet connection was good. That was tough. You know, um, really, really gave him a new layer. So Hunter, you've done it. You've trumped yeah. Gary. Maybe the comments will say Gary robbed. Um, who knows? I, sometimes, great. sometimes you just got to shake it up. I didn't pass out, which is great. You know, the chlorine smell, I'm either used to it or it's gone. So another big <laughs> win for me there. Uh, I also was going to say we were most ahead in app development when it came to UDISC. Mm -hmm. um, and then I looked at pickleball apps and I quickly rescinded my answer. There's some dirty pickleball apps oh. out there. It seems a lot of it's just been adapted from tennis. A little cheap there, but you know, you could also say similar things. Weird. About it's golf. So <laughs> we, weird yeah. how you would do something like that. But, <laughs> yeah. Why would you change from that? Why sport? would you model? Why would you model your sport that's modeled after another sport? Brody, I had another question I wanted to at, pick your brain on. Okay. So Rory, that missed three foot putt. Brutal. What is the equivalence of that in disc golf? Like how far away is Gannon Burr missing a putt for you to say that was equal? Well, it has to be, you have to think about a putt that a guy would make 500 times in a row on tour that year. I would say that's probably equivalent. Here's the thing. I think it would have to be, it couldn't be a straightforward putt. It would have to be um, a putt where like he was on top. Okay. This is a perfect example. You know, Jonesboro hole, what is it? Nine. The one that's the par four that you throw over the little creek. Yep. And then, you know, the big throwers can even give themselves an eagle chance. Mm -hmm. If you leave your putt up there and you're staring down that hill, I think it's like a 20, like a 28 footer. That's, really? Yeah, Brody. Rory staring made down Rory that hill. 496, 496 of them in a row. You think the pro disc golfer is making 496 of those in a row before missing one? Gannon? That's a terrible example. No, no, no. The example. I was has thinking to, like 15 feet. No, the, the example has to be one that uh, brings it has to be a putt the, that a guy would never miss unless it, there was so much pressure that they were forced to miss it. 
That's it's crazy. That, it, that, it, it broke a lot. I don't it was think, a hard I don't think footer, Gannon. I don't think Gannon misses that many. Okay, first off, Gannon might not be the perfect example because his putt is a classic spit out putt. So take whoever you want putting wise. That's inside the circle. That's really good. They're not missing that many from like 28, 25 feet. So the the pressure would be them knowing that if I miss, it's going to the bottom of the hill. That's the equivalence. You can't just have because the pre, the pressure. I'm saying, I'm saying it's like hole 18, major on the line pressure. I oh, think it's, right. I think it's like a 10 foot tap it. I was saying it, it's, it's a just far enough that you can miss it, no, but it's no close enough. A 10 footer ever. No, I was thinking it's, 15. Rory would, never missed. Rory like, never missed a two and a half footer. That ever. was a hard putt though, Trevor. That was a hard putt. That, that you don't think he had other hard, hard two and a half footers and he made 500 of them. How about, no, no, how about so like low. a 15 foot straddler? None of them were two and a half footer. He's got a straddle now. It's hole 16. It's hole 16. The one was he made 496 for 496. So he didn't yeah. miss that putt. He did not ever. make 496 putts inside of three feet at the U.S. Open, though, Trevor. You have to understand there's it's, a massive difference between putting on those greens and putting on the He made the rest PGA of them for that entire tournament. He put it insanely well. And he'll tell you that. <laughs> that's a ter- 28 downhill <laughs> putt. That's or, a terrible uh, example. I, I, just called, no. I, just call, I just called him Brooks. That would be really, really bad. Bryson. <laughs> Bryson literally, oh, no. just again. Bryson literally just missed one um, not that far yeah. from three feet either. Well, that was I'm it. Rory, Rory missed tough. one on hole 16, too. Do you, mean, do you only look up how many people miss putts inside of three feet at the U.S. Open? I guarantee it's more than any other tournament combined. I, I would agree with it's, you. I'm saying they play on hard. It, it, it has to be if a putt is so close – that he had like they play other hard greens. I understand that they're not as hard as that those greens, but they play other hard ones. The greens at Augusta are hard too. Ten feet's too close. Well, now, F- now FPO maybe, but MPO ten feet's too close. We haven't. I seen disagree because I think I if you think, go think any further, I think maybe it's fifteen That's feet. But I'm, if you go I'm any further, 15. a guy's not making five hundred in a row. Like fifteen is is missable. Yeah, it has but to be like, that's they would missable, never miss it. but you're not missing I mean, there it. Unless- was, there was a point where Ezra uh, Ezra Airhold made what was it like eight tournaments in a row? He hadn't missed a circle one putt. Yeah, but they could have all point. been twenty footers. That's that's that means nothing. That, that's kind of my point, though. It can't be fifteen feet if you it's, said he all made twenty footers. It's but. Katrina. It's Katrina Allen on hole seventeen at the Pro Tour Championship, uh, putting like five times from fifteen to twenty feet on that elevated basket. That's a hard Dang. putt, though. That's what I'm saying. The putting up, up, putting up, elevated is like fifteen foot elevated basket. I think that's fair. yes. I think yeah. I think it has to be twenty-eight. kind of crazy, but that's what I'm saying is it has to be something that's like a level yeah. change. You yeah, can't just say fair. fifteen feet flat. Yeah, yeah. No one's no one's missing a fifteen footer. I was just curious. I want to hear in the thought. comments below. I want to hear everybody else's yeah. take on that. <laughs> I want to know what people, what the equivalent is. Maybe you need to tweet that Brody, tweet that out. That, but that was, that was like the hardest three foot putt you could have Yeah, downhill slider left to right. That, that's a scary yeah. putt. It is. No, it is. I, it is. It's, it was definitely a now difficult what I will putt. Say, we haven't seen a disc golfer that I know of yet. Mess up so bad on hole 18 that they withdraw out of the next like three tournaments before playing another one. Yeah, mm-hmm. he probably didn't. They probably didn't. It, it, maybe what if Ricky, White... what's what's worse, that or them DNFing from the tournament? I think DNFing from the tournament's worse. Well, I'm just saying, yeah. like we haven't had I think like he finished. So, but I'm saying, yeah. well, yeah. Imagine he just picks his ball that, up after missing the. That would be a disc golf move. That would be a dis- yeah. I don't want this to go so against my ratings. Everybody. Yeah, I don't want this to go against my ratings. <laughs> See ya. This never happened. Go no, back to history books. It's a DNF. I got. Yeah. I, I hurt myself. You have no that sounds, idea. That sounds like a foundation a video idea. How much pressure can you put on a ten foot putt for a video? Oh, for us, not none us, at all. It had to be a five footer. Okay. Yeah, I'd miss it for free. Uh, for me to make four hundred and ninety six of a putt in a row, it's gonna have to be real close to the basket. I, I'm real surprised close. that you think there's not that many people that can make five hundred putts in a row from twenty eight feet downhill. Yeah, nobody. Nobody on tour is making that putt you described okay. 500 okay. times in a row. Okay, that's why I said it, though, because literally, Rory, that what you asked, what is the equivalent to the putt that Rory had? I gave you one. If you would have said, what's the equivalent to the Bryson DeChambeau putt, because Bryson DeChambeau had a three-footer on Hawaii. I understand not, that the putt not. was difficult. Yeah. I understand yeah, that the Bryson putt was DeChambeau, difficult. I would have said he had plenty. Feet. He in in five hundred putts. He had plenty of other putts of that length that were difficult, but and no, he made all Trevor, of them. But Trevor, if I would have given, if you would have given Rory five hundred putts of that putt randomly throughout the season, I bet he, he would makes ninety percent of them. 
That's still a lie. He's missing. Right, that's, but it's, I'm saying, but it's 50 it's, putts. He's missing. And you're you're night, everyone. Actually, actually, you actually he, based you're on saying, the statistics of that season, he probably point. missed them all. You're saying yeah. he just missed 50 putts inside of three, three feet. That's my point. Exactly. It's a hard putt. Yeah. Hey, Dustin, where are you never playing know. this weekend, man? We'll never know. He, <laughs> made, <'cause> he, made, <laughs> he made all the other ones, so we'll never know. Hey, Rory should have just picked up the ball and said, let's just tap in and just walked off the court. Yeah, he's counting it. That's what no, he should have done. No, do, uh, do what the – just drag the ball to the basket. Yeah, similar just to just dunking. Just yeah. <laughs> hey, give me range is forever changed now because now yeah, somebody it. tries to pick up a putt inside of three feet be like, well, Rory missed it. So you're not getting oh, that you can't give, give You can't give – it's got to be inside the leather, man. Yeah. Inside the leather, I, I, two feet. It, New precedent. Mm-hmm. All right, all right. That's enough of that golf talk, that dirty golf sport. Um, yeah, no one up, enjoyed. No one throw that QR that. code up on no the screen. No one liked that. <laughs> if you want to submit a uh, a topic for next week's episode, we had one featured this week. Uh, make sure to scan that QR code or click the link in the description. Love the topic submissions. You guys have been on fire with them. A lot of entertaining ones. Even the ones that don't make it on the show sometimes just make me laugh because you guys have some crazy ideas, and I love it. Keep submitting those. I always check them every week. We'll be back next week, another episode. Comment down below, like if you enjoyed it. We'll see you then.